So welcome to the most exclusive session of the day, I'd say, right? Uh, you won't regret it. Uh, Paige Harden is the kind of person that scares you, right? Because some people are good at one thing, and we try to be good at one thing, but there are people who are like world experts in two or three different things. So A, she's a leading scholar on adolescence and risk-taking. She will talk about this a bit later with the Vaki uh, teacher ambassadors, but she's also a behavioral geneticist and studies the role of genes in particular with regard to education and learning. And that's a topic that is sort of really important, uh, heavily discussed in, in parts of the world and probably not so much in other communities as we see here. But those who are here uh, can look forward to a great presentation. So flying in from Austin, Texas, great to have you here, Paige. Welcome, Paige Harden. Hi, thank you all. So I am from the University of Texas. And UT was in the news recently as one of a few elite universities in which wealthy American parents have been bribing school officials, soccer coaches, faking standardized tests in order to get their children into school. We have a, a little bit of pride that they were doing this for the University of Texas and not for Texas A&M. So I guess we're really an elite university. Um, but the college admissions scandal has focused a national conversation in the U.S. on not just the illegal ways that wealthy parents can get their children into college, but the many legal ways in which the children of the rich are advantaged relative to the children of the poor. And we can see this obviously on a global scale if we're thinking about the educational opportunities available to children in high-income countries relative to low-income countries. But we can also see this within a country. So this, um, I'm showing you some data from the United States, looking at the rate at which children or students graduate college or university by their family income. So for students who come from the lowest quartile of family income, this is about less than $30,000 per year in the United States. 9% of those students go on to graduate from college. And we can contrast that with children who come from the wealthiest families in the US, so the top quartile of income. These are families that are making more than $100,000 per year, and over half of those students graduate from college. So looking at a graph like this, looking at this data, 9% versus 54%, I think we can ask ourselves if we could make the educational system work exactly how we want it to work, if you could wave a magic wand and change an educational system, how would the rates of college completion differ between poor students and rich students? And I think most people, um, if they had to imagine their ideal educational system, would imagine a world in which your chances of educational success were unrelated to your family background, or a poor child had the same chances of graduating from college as a rich child. And in fact, if we look at the OECD definition of educational equity, they define equity as, in part, having chances in education that are unrelated to background characteristics that are not within the child's control. So a child can't control the income of their parents. Um, that's an accident of birth. That's something that's lucky that happened to them. And so why should their chances in life be constrained by this thing over which they have no control? Um, so this idea that children's success in education shouldn't be due to their background characteristics um, is, is talked about in terms of equity and is often represented um, in terms of this metaphor of children trying to see, this is a very American metaphor, trying to see into a baseball game. And the fence is higher for some children because they're facing more background obstacles. But the idea of educational equity is that we then provide those children with intensive resources, with more learning opportunities, such that their real opportunities for success are matched to those of children from advantaged backgrounds. So when we look at a graph like this, when we're looking at differences in rates of college completion by college income, we can do three things, and we do it very, very automatically. One, we just notice it. We notice this as a pattern in our society, in, in probably every country in the world, and we think of it as meaningful and as significant. The second thing that we do is we have a framework for thinking about whether or not this equality is fair or unfair. And most people would agree that this is a form of inequality that's unfair, 
because a child's educational success is governed by things that they cannot control, their family's income. And the third thing that we do is we take this inequality into account in almost every aspect of educational research and educational policy. So I'd like for you to imagine how your work would be different if all of the information you had about the economic background of your students or of the children in your country disappeared. If you didn't know whether they came from a rich country or a poor country, you didn't know anything about economic inequalities, how would that hamper your ability to bring about the positive change you want to see for your classroom, for your school, for your educational system? So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about another inequality, a variable that predicts a child's chance of graduating from college just as much as family income does. So in this um, figure, I'm showing you uh, the rates of college completion in white students in the United States, broken down by mystery variable X. And what we can see is that children who are in the bottom quartile of this mystery variable have about a 14% chance of graduating from college, and children who are in the top quartile of this mystery variable have a 53% chance of graduating from college. So a very similar inequality to what we're seeing for family income. Except this variable isn't income. It isn't anything we're measuring about the child's environment. It's the child's DNA. So technology for measuring DNA has been exponentially growing. And now we're at the point in which, with a sample of saliva, about two milliliters, um, you can genotype, and by genotype I mean measure an individual person's DNA letters for about $50 to $60 per person, and that price is dropping every day. So what do you do with that genetic information? There's a lot of information that you can get out of a person's genome, but one very common use of it is to calculate something called a polygenic score. Now, a polygenic score is basically saying, I'm going to measure a lot of different aspects of a child's DNA, and I'm going to apply a scoring algorithm to that. I'm basically going to add up the number of genetic variants that an individual person has that's statistically associated with an outcome like education. So what I'm showing you here is the results from a study of 1.1 million people in which they correlated their uh, students' DNA with the number of years of education that they completed. And then they took that as a scoring algorithm in a new sample, again, of white students in the US, and found that that polygenic score can predict a child's chance of ultimately graduating from college, as well as their family income can. Okay. So as soon as I brought up the word polygenic score, some of your faces changed. Um, uncomfortable, skeptical, confused. Because I started talking about, talking about equity in education, and that is a goal. And now I'm talking about genetic differences. And for the past 150 years, even before we had the word genetic, even before we had the word gene, before we had any understanding of how DNA actually worked, when people have talked about inherited differences or about genetic differences, they have talked about it as an enemy of equity. So there have been people who are saying, we want greater social equality, we want greater social justice. And there have been other people who have said, social justice is impossible, we will be unable to um, make a more equal world because the differences that we see between people are innate. They're unfixable, they're genetic. Um, obviously, this motivated historical atrocities in the US and in Europe, people use the idea of inherited differences um, to forcibly sterilize people, to limit immigration, um, to commit mass murder. So it is a dangerous idea to talk about genetic differences between people as meaningful for understanding their life outcomes. We also don't have to go back in time in order to find people talking about genetic differences in a ways that seem profoundly problematic and uncomfortable. Um, we can look, for example, to the President of the United States, who, and let's see if this video works. Back to the, the path to be born and the 
Okay, so we can laugh at that, at him talking about, I believe in the gene thing. But what is he saying there? When President Trump says, I believe in the gene thing, what is he saying? What are some of the ideas that are embedded in that statement? And I think there are three things, three dangerous ideas that have historically and continue to accompany our discussion of genetic differences. And the first of those ideas is the idea of genetic essentialism. So genetic essentialism is the idea that, one, people have an essence, they have a true self, who they really are, and two, that that true self, that that real self, is defined by your genes. It's not defined by your actions, it's not defined by the person that you have created for yourself, the person that you've become, but that there's some essence of a person located in your genotype. And I think what's dangerous about that idea is that then things that we usually make as moral judgments of being praiseworthy, of blameworthy, of being worthwhile as a human, our moral worth starts to become attached to our DNA. And I think that, it's, that, that is a deeply dangerous idea to start thinking about genes in terms of good genes or bad genes. The second idea you can see in President Trump's comments is this idea of genetic determinism. So the idea that your genes determine your outcome, and that if you don't have certain genes, then certain outcomes are impossible for you. If you aren't born with the gene for success, then you're not going to be wealthy. You're not going to be good at education. And the, the reason why this idea is dangerous is because it saps our political will to try to create a better world. We're here because we're talking about what changes the world. But if you think that the possibility of change is non-existent because your DNA determines your life outcomes, then your motivation for trying to change the world is diminished. It's sapped. Third, and President Trump didn't refer to this specifically, but I think any conversation about genetics has to address this, is the historical and continuing association between genetics and scientific racism, in which genetics is not just used to talk about why some people are better than other people, but why, 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 why some races are better than other races. And obviously, this has motivated historical atrocities, prejudice, and discrimination to this day. So what we have is a conversation that's been happening for over a century in which the idea of inherited differences has been motivated as an enemy of our goals for equality, our goals for a more equal world. And what I want to do, what I want to suggest, is can we take the science of genetic differences and peel it away from these ideas that have plagued any discussion of inherited characteristics for the last century and actually use the tools of modern genomics as a tool for equity. That is the thing that I think that we need to be doing in the face of the DNA revolution. This is a difficult thing to do because we're so used to thinking about genetic differences in a certain frame of mind. So I want to talk about what are our alternatives to interpreting genetic science that are not essentialistic, that are not deterministic, and that do not feed into scientific racism. Um, so in, as an alternative to genetic essentialism, I want to talk about the idea of genetic luck. As an alternative to determinism, I want to talk about genetics as a tool for identifying potential for growth. And instead of scientific racism, I want to talk about the importance of prioritizing diversity in the modern genomics research world. Okay. So what do I mean by genetic luck? I want to contrast how we talk about the genetics of education with the way that we talk about the genetics of other things we can measure about people. So some of you might recognize this person. His name is Sean Bradley. He was a um, basketball player for the Dallas Mavericks, and he was notable for being very tall. He's seven and a half feet tall, which I believe translates to two meters, 28 centimeters in um, metric terms. So very, very, very tall. He was recently on a plane, and he was sitting next to a geneticist who said, well, have you ever been genotyped? Do you know why you're so tall? And he said, oh, no, I don't know why I'm so tall. That's a great idea. So they measured his DNA, and what they were expecting to find is that maybe he had some really, really rare genetic variant something that made him unusually tall, but that um, 
you know, doesn't, is basically a mutation that happened just for him. But what they found instead is that he has the same genetic variants that make, might make me a little bit taller than one of you. He just got a lot of them. So his polygenic score for height is almost five standard deviations above the mean in the population. And in all of the conversations about this, there was no reference to him being better or him being essentially good. It was all about him being lucky. So the Wall Street Journal said he, he seems to have won the jump ball of genetic luck, inheriting a combination of entirely normal genetic variants that in combination help make him taller than 99.9999% of people on Earth. So why does luck change our frame? I think when we think about lottery winners, we think about people who have um, gotten something by chance. We think of them as perhaps entitled to spin their lottery winnings, but we don't think of them as inherently praiseworthy. There's nothing about me that makes me good just because I happen to have a winning lottery ticket. And that's very much how Sean Bradley talks about his own genetic luck. Let's think about taking that same frame of genetic luck, but not for height, but for the other things we can measure about people, including how far they go into education. This was a point I tried to make this summer in an editorial I wrote for the New York Times, in which I wrote that no one has earned their DNA sequence. It's pure luck. No more than I could choose that to be born to American parents who were middle class in the 1980s, I also couldn't choose which genetic variants I was born with. And I believe that everyone deserves to share in prosperity regardless of which genetic variants they happen to inherit. Because in the same way that we don't think a child's opportunities for educational success should depend on their family income, because that's something they couldn't control, I also don't think that someone's ability to share in national prosperity should depend on their, which genetic variants they happen to inherit. Because again, that's something they couldn't control. Second, instead of thinking of genes as deterministic, can we think about genetic information being used to identify potential for growth? Um, so I'm going to give you an example from my own research that my lab is working on in which we're looking at polygenic scores in relation to children's progress through the math curriculum. And I shouldn't say children, it's actually adolescents there. We're looking at high school students and which math classes they take um, and how far they persist in math in high school. So in American high schools, um, in the ninth grade, the most common class for you to be put into is Algebra 1. Um, but you could be placed in a more advanced track, so you could be placed in geometry, or you could be placed in a less advanced track. You could be placed in pre-algebra. So what I'm showing you here is data that suggests that in American high schools, kids who have higher polygenic scores are more likely to be placed in advanced math classes in the ninth grade. So this is happening around the age of 14 in American high schools. But we also looked at how this plays out in different types of high schools. In high schools that are advantaged, that serve mostly parents, children of parents who have high socioeconomic status, mostly children of college-educated parents, versus um, schools in which the, most of the families do not have a college education. And what we can see here is that for students who have a very high polygenic score, their chances of being tracked into an advanced math class is much, much higher if they're in an advantaged high school versus a disadvantaged high school. On the same time, we can see that for children who have a low polygenic score, their chances of receiving that more intensive and more advanced math education in the ninth grade is low regardless of what high school they're in. And I think we can look at this result and we can see room for growth in two ways. One, we have this, we can think of as untapped potential. Students with high polygenic scores who are genetically predicted to succeed in education, um, but who were in disadvantaged low resource schools um, and who are not taking math classes, advanced math curriculum, at the same rates as people who have the same genetic propensities but are in disadvantaged schools. At the same time, I think we can see a lot of room for growth um, for students who have low polygenic scores. In the same way that a teacher would see someone with a identified learning disability and not say, 
well, we need to give up on this child's education, but would rather say, what resources and supports does this particular student need in order to maximize their chances of education? I think we can think about genetic information in that same way. The other thing we looked at is persistence in math. So how many years of math did you take after the ninth grade? Um, in Texas, you have to take uh, just two years of math to graduate from high school. So ninth grade and 10th grade, and then you can stop. And what we can see here is that for students with high polygenic scores, they're persisting in math regardless of their school context. But what we're seeing is that the advantaged schools are buffering students who are at risk in terms of their genotype for a math dropout. So students who have low polygenic scores but are in advantaged high schools are much less likely to drop out of math. Again, we can think of room for growth there in terms of how can we increase the math persistence of students who are at risk for dropping out because we can see that advantaged high schools are succeeding in doing this very thing. Last thing, how do we deal with genetic information in a global world without feeding into scientific racism? How can we promote diversity? And I think currently this is a real problem in the genomics research world, um, which has had a profound Eurocentric bias. So people from Europe or who are in North America of exclusively European genetic ancestry make up 16% of the global population, but they make up 79% of people who've participated in genetic research. And what that means is that any advantages that flow from genetic knowledge, any uses of personalized medicine, of progress in education that proceeds from genomic research, right now all of those benefits are flowing directly to the most advantaged people in the globe, which are people in North America, people in Europe. So uh, the major challenge we have is how can we expand the global research base when it comes to genomic research? At the same time, that's a prospect that scares people, right? There is a history of biocolonialism. There is a history of taking natural resources including the, the biological natural resources of a country and using it for the advantage of advantaged groups. Um, my colleague at the University of Texas at Austin, Kevin Coakley, has written about this, and I think very, very incisively, about how can we take tools that have historically been used for oppression and use them for ways that benefit minority populations, that benefit a historically oppressed populations. And the first thing that he points out is that it's not enough to just have people who are um, involved in research as participants, but it's imperative to involve people in research as scientists, as investigators. And I think even more than um, the lack of representation of people who aren't European as research subjects, there is also a huge lack of representation in genomic science and the science side of people outside of Europe, which is a major problem that our field needs to overcome. The second thing that he talks about is avoiding default comparisons to whiteness. Avoiding um, the idea that the, that the European, what we see in Europeans is the universal standard against which other people should be compared. And the third thing is to focus on deeper level process variables. So if we find that membership in a racial or ethnic group is predictive of some outcome. To go beyond um, the group label to think about, well, what is the variable that's driving this? Is, this? is this about poverty? Is this about systemic racism? Is this about some aspect of culture that we can measure, rather than just treating people as labels? So this is obviously a challenge, going from genetic essentialism to thinking about genetic luck to separating our ideas of genes from gen genetic determinism and trying to think creatively about how we can use genetic information to identify room for growth. And also peeling away genetics from scientific racism in ways that prioritize diversity and involve the global population in research, both as research participants and as research scientists and as beneficiaries of that research. These are all major challenges. But at the same time, genetic technology is improving every day. 
Over 10 million people have been genotyped just from consumer genetic companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. And one article in Current Opinions in Biology had the headline, the consumer genetics revolution is going to affect you whether you want it to or not. So I think now is the time for us to have a frank and difficult conversation about how is this information going to be used in the service of our goals of equity, both in education, but also in medicine and beyond. Thank you. There is time for questions, but I'll take the liberty to ask the first one, <laughs> right? At what point in time will we be able to design teaching or learning strategies for children based on their individual genetic information? Or will we ever be? Or should I, we? Uh, that's a great question. So I think um, this idea that genetic information is going to be a tool for personalized learning has been, I think, one of the most commonly offered ideas. Um, I th I, I'm less optimistic than many people are. And I think that's because genetic information currently is useful in thinking about group differences or in thinking about population trends. But that's a different thing from identifying something specific about an individual, right? So I can say that in this group of people, there's a 50% chance of going to college. But that's a very different thing than having an individually diagnostic test. So in statistical terms, a polygenic score predicts 13% of the variance. We can contrast that with the sort of diagnostic test that you would use if you went to a doctor's office, right? A pregnancy test is not 13% of the variance, right? It's telling you definitively you're pregnant or not. And there's no genetic tool right now that I think, particularly for education, has that level of certainty attached to it. So I think rather than thinking about how can we use genetic information to personalize learning, I think we can think about it in terms of um, we have lots of different theories about which, which levers do we need to pull in order to exert environmental change. And for many of those theories, genetic information is something, genetic sort of background differences between people, between people has been something that hasn't really been considered. So I think the most promising use of this right now is as a variable that allows us to account for individual differences so that we can study the effects of the environment more effectively. Excellent. There is a question here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, stand up, yes. Uh, Susan Hashem, hello. Hello. Uh, actually, I just want to say that um, thank you for this. It's a long time coming. Uh, it is, uh, it scares us all a little bit. There mm -hmm. is a big brother uh, factor into it. It's uh, we, we will control people's lives. But it's a long time coming because those of us in education, we know this. We try on our clothes, we try on our shoes, we get to pick what we eat, but there's a curriculum, one, yeah. that is to fit everyone, and yeah. that cannot remain. Actually, m maybe my question is no longer a question because I want, I, uh, maybe I just want to add to the gentleman over there, is more than the teaching, when will the time come where we design a curriculum mm -hmm. that will fit a person based on this kind of study? And to, so that they, it will take them into the right pathway. Maybe not a four-year education, tertiary education, but in the right pathway so that they will have a viable future. Yeah. Thank you. So I, just to piggyback on that, I, I think there's this tendency to think of genetic information as, as fundamentally different from all other sources of information. That either you're paying attention to genetic information or you're paying attention to any, all of the other things that you can know about a child. And um, so I'm not super familiar with how this works in countries outside of the United States, but in the United States, we have uh, if you're in a, a child in a public school and they have a learning disability or a speech disorder, you have an individualized education plan where you sit down and with the teacher and with the principal and you talk about what services does this child need. And at no point is someone saying, well, we only need to focus on this category of information, right? So I would like to get to a point in which we don't think of genetics as fundamentally different from the other things we can measure about a child, but essentially how can this help us when bringing different sources of information together? Um, and I just want to reflect back to your comment that yes, it is scary, right? I don't think we should be Pollyanna-ish Pollyanna or overly 
um, optimistic about the dangers associated with genetic information, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it in terms of an educational context. Um, just a little question. I know nothing about this. I am in total novice. Great. But I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so great. What I'd like to know is what happens if you do this sort of the other way around? Someone with a low polygenic score gets told, you've got a super high polygenic score. <laughs> you are so, you're, you're so lucky. You lucked out. You're highly, mm -hmm. I don't know, you've got a high probability yeah. of going into university and being successful. Wouldn't that have just as big an impact or even a bigger impact than the actual polygenic I, score? Yeah. I mean, I think we don't know at this point in time. Um, so I think, you know, when we're, we're, when we're thinking about genetic effects on educational success, um, what we're picking up on is any trait that's associated with your genes that promote success in education. So this can be things like, um, capacities to regulate attention, this could be motivation, this could be curiosity, this could be persistence, this could be physical attractiveness that it causes your teachers to respond to you more positively. Anything that's associated with your genotype that um, is correlated with success in education is going to be picked up on this. So um, it's difficult for me as an a priori hypothesis to, to anticipate that simply telling someone that they have a high polygenic score versus a low polygenic score is going to be more powerful than that sum effect of all of our genetically associated characteristics. But that's just a guess, and we don't know. And I think the reason why we don't know is that the science of um, how can we give information about their genotypes back to people, how is that interpreted, how can we educate people such that it's interpreted correctly versus incorrectly, that science is in such its infancy that I don't think we have really good empirically validated statements that I can, I can tell you about what's the best way to do that. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, in terms of your research, when it, um, when it comes to sort of neuroscience, so I'm quite interested in how creating fluency in arithmetic um, can create a an ability in an individual to do things automatically. Mm -hmm. So you can radically improve maths by automating arithmetic. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious as to whether the genotype can impact how quickly someone could do that and whether one could say that it's an inevitability that it will happen, but that it may happen more or less quickly for some people. Mm -hmm. Just one of those, have you I think thoughts? that that's, um, that's not an implausible hypothesis. So. Um, I don't think this has been looked at with early mathematical skills, but it has been looked at with early reading. So what you see is that um, children with higher education polygenic scores, what's happening is they're getting to a certain level of reading ability more quickly, which of course has some sort of virtuous cycle effects. The more easily you read, the more easily you acquire some content and the, um, that improves your subsequent performance. More generally, I would say what that question is, it's a question about process, right? So we have a very, very basic biological variable, which is your DNA, and you have a very complicated social process at the end, which is graduating from college. And I think those sorts of questions of what are the processes that connect the two, such as earlier um, uh, automization of arithmetic, are exactly the sort of questions that we should be asking in the developmental psych world right now. And the person to directly address this question was Daniel Ansaro, who's sitting back there. So if you want to talk about early mathematics, that's the guy. With I see another question. Oh, you were first on the keyboard. Uh, you outlined a very, um, a, a, the positive possibilities where we can look at growth potential for students or um, you know, target help to those who have low polygenic scores and so on. Um, as it's been acknowledged, there also there are the sort of the, the nightmare scenarios. What as society do we need to do to make sure that um, we use this information in a positive way in schools, rather than sort of seeing children labelled and you know, put in little ghettos or whatever? Um, what is it that as a society we can do to make this a positive rather than a negative for children? Yeah, so that that's quite a challenging question, um, and I would say the first. The first thing that comes to mind is that it's a conversation that needs to be happening not just within the genetics community. So all the time I'm asked, well, what does this mean for education policy or what does this mean for teachers? 
And that's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is behavioral genetics. So what I'm really excited about is a conversation with people who are on the front lines of education as teachers, as school administrators, as policymakers. I think right now most of the conversation about genetics and its association with education is kind of this open secret that people in genetics talk about but that isn't widely known in the education world. And so I think in order to answer that question, what does a society need to do? What does an educational system need to do? We need to have the answer not just come from people who are the, doing the genetics work, but people who are really well versed in education policy. Um, and so that's, the, I think that conversation is the starting point towards answering that question. Two more questions we can take. I'll go here first. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, yeah. I find your presentation quite terrifying, actually. And the question is, what is the probability that your hypothesis is wrong and that actually it's just the interpretation of your data that is wrong? And I, I give you some background. In terms of genetics, we didn't understand how genes worked for a very, very long time. And there were lots of um, crazy ideas yeah. at the time, you know, pangenesis and <laughs> it wasn't, you know, Mendel's research was yeah. forgotten for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, if, if I'm right, your research is largely within white yes. communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So have you done similar um, research within immigrant communities who actually pursue education. Yeah, so I'll take the second half of that question first because that's the easiest, and the, the answer is no, in the sense that um, because the vast majority of people who have been genotyped on Earth are coming from European ancestry populations, our ability to um, essentially develop algorithms to, to create a polygenic score that are predictive of any outcomes really only works within European ancestry populations right now. So that has two implications. One is that comparisons between ethnic groups or racial groups in terms of genotype are completely scientifically meaningless. We don't have any basis for doing that. And the second is that if you try to take genetic information that you've learned from European ancestry people and try to port it into anyone else, it doesn't work. So the same polygenic score um, has been looked at in relation to GPAs and African American students in the United States, for instance, and it is not as predictive, not nearly, as we see in white people. There's a lot of technical reasons for why that is about the structure of the genome, um, but again, if there's any possibility that this is going to be used in ways that advantage people, um, in ways that uh, give them medical or educational benefits. Right now, that's only going to be working to the benefit of European ancestry uh, populations, just because the research doesn't exist outside of that. Um, the second thing about, is this a little bit terrifying? Um, yes, I think it is. I mean, I, I see the research that I'm doing, I'm seeing the research that my colleagues are doing, and of course, we have a long history of these ideas being used to justify all sorts of dehumanizing, violent policies against people. At the same time, that technology is here, and wishing it away is not happening. We can genotype people easily at scale, and it's happening. So I think a, an approach that says, what are we going to do with this genetic information, and what ideas do we need to strip away from it? I, I, I think we, there's kind of no way out of having that conversation right now. Every time you go to a hospital, they're using the same methodologies for you. Hi, yeah, yeah, thanks. Really, really interesting um, and complicated. I was just wondering, kind of going back to the, sorry, my name's Owen, uh, to the, the basketball example with Sean Bradley. <laughs> That's a, you know, it's a very easy, I understand why you present it pedagogically, but it's also, it's a single category. It's very narrowly defined, but also, if you think about it, that specific trait is only advantageous in a very narrow circumstance, which is basketball. And so if mm -hmm. you're talking about, I don't know, football or soccer, it's a, that being 7.6 wouldn't be advantageous. And so what I was wondering in terms of some of your background research is obviously there'll be some more general traits associated with general intelligence, whatever yeah. that means, but something about that. But then there's probably or presumably all these other traits, um, you know, such as interpersonal communication or something else, whatever the underlying variable, that would be hyper would only be advantageous in a very specific context that's likely to change rapidly. And I was just wondering if you have any sense of, you know, 
of the bulk of the predictive validity? Is it mainly kind of these unknown, very hyper context specific factors, or is there also some of it that's more general and underlying? Yeah, so I, you're picking up on some a really, really interesting um, issue there in terms of, I, I'm gonna broaden the question out a little bit in terms of how do our intuitions about what it means for something to be genetic or heritable or correlated with genotypes change when we're talking about something that is broadly advantageous in m multiple societies at multiple points in time, something like um, abstract reasoning ability versus something like height, which is clearly advantageous on the labor market if you're a basketball player, but is not that relevant for success in lots of other arenas in life. Um, I think an interesting example to think about that's kind of in, not in the middle there, but as another data point here, is how our narratives around um, genetic influence on autism spectrum disorders play out in the public domain. So autism spectrum disorders are also something in which at the low end of functioning, that's very impairing of success in multiple domains of life, occupationally and educationally. At the same time, and, and I'll also say, there's also a really ugly history behind how people have dealt with autism spectrum disorders, right? Like Hans Asperger's collaborated with Nazis around euthanizing children with autism spectrum disorders, what we would now call that. Um, but at the same time, we don't find it controversial to say that autism is heritable in, in the United States, to say that genes influence your chances of autism. And we also have an autism rights disability movement in the United States in which people say, well, this is my way of functioning and society's responsibility is to accommodate my, my unique ways of operating in the world. Um, for instance, you have offices that are entirely set up for the needs of people who have autism spectrum disorders. So I think we have examples in which there is clearly a genetic influence on something and clearly a genetic influence on something that at times can be very, very impairing of occupational and educational functioning. But we don't attribute that to someone being having less human worth. Instead, we say that places a burden on society to um, accommodate the unique needs of who, with people with a particular way of functioning you know, in the world. And I think that's a, that's a difficult, that is such a shift from the way that we're used to talking about, quote unquote, the genetics of intelligence. But I do think that there is examples there in which people's intuitions have moved over time about what it means for something to be heritable. Um, but that's a, really, that's, that's a really interesting and difficult question to grapple with. Thank you very much, Paige, for giving us a starting point for a conversation that we all need to have in the years, in the decades to come, and it will come. Thank you so much. Thank you.